on my head. He's in the wine and he's in the bread. He's in the pulpit and he's in the pew. He lives in me and he lives in you. And I know everywhere I go, Jesus comes along with me. I'm going to show all the people I know, Jesus comes along with me. And he's in the hall. He's in my friends and my family. He's in my neighbor crying out to me. And I know everywhere I go, Jesus comes along with me. I'm gonna show all the people I know, Jesus comes along with me. The sun fights the horizon, night is over his eyes. Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. Let us stand and begin with our call to worship. People of God, what are you looking for? People of God, what are you looking for? People of God, what are you looking for? All these things we are looking for, God gives to us freely. Come, let us worship the Lord. Come into His presence with thanksgiving in your heart and give Him praise, and give Him praise. Into his presence with thanksgiving in your heart and voices raised, your voices raised, give glory and honor. People of God, we vacillate between worshiping God and worshiping the marketplace and other idols. Let us confess our sin and receive God's forgiveness.
God of grace, you know what is in everyone. You know how prone we are. Do you confess that we do often create gods that encourage us to pursue our own ends instead of worshiping the God who created and loved us? In the name of Christ, you. And do you confess that in our desire to get ahead or to entertain ourselves, we show little concern for the people we hurt in the process? In the name of Christ, you. Do you confess that in seeing the earth as something that exists to serve our ends, we do violence to creation and we dishonor God. But even in all this, there is good news for those who believe. There is the good news that God so loved the world that he sent his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. Because of this, I declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. Please be seated, and if Paisley Ann and her godparents and parents could please come up. <clears throat> Ann, kids in the congregation, you guys come up too. Um, have a seat or stand around here so that you guys can see what's going on here a little bit better. Come on down here. And we're waiting on Joel. I don't know where downstairs. Ah, okay. Okay. You're a little big, but you can you can come on up. <laughs> God, who is rich in mercy and love, gives us a new birth through the gift of baptism. The power of sin is put to death in this holy bath, and we are raised with Jesus Christ to new life. Through this sacrament, we are united with all the baptized into the one body of Christ, anointed with the Holy Spirit, and sent out to serve as disciples of Jesus Christ. Trusting in grace and love of God, do you desire to have Paisley Ann baptized into Christ? If so, answer, we do. We do. As you bring her for baptism, you are entrusted with responsibilities. To live with her among God's faithful people, to bring her to the Word of God and the Holy Supper, and nurture her in faith and prayer so that Paisley Ann may learn to trust God, to proclaim Christ through word and deed, to care for others in the world God made, and to be equipped to work for justice and peace. Do you promise to help Paisley Ann grow as a disciple of our Lord Jesus Christ? Again, if so, answer, we do. We do. People of God, do you promise to support Paisley Ann, her parents, and her godparents, to create relationships with them and pray for them as they celebrate this new life in Christ? Let's try that again. People of God. <laughs> Do you promise to support Paisley Ann and her family and her godparents and to develop and grow relationships with them as they raise Paisley Ann in the faith? If so, answer, we do. We do. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I ask you now to profess your faith in Christ Jesus, to reject sin and confess the faith of the church. Do you renounce the devil and all the forces that defy God? the powers of this world that rebel against God, and the ways of sin that separate us from God, from neighbor, and from God's good creation? If so, answer, we do. We do. And let us all together now confess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, 
the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Paisley Ann Helen Thompson, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, and if all of you can gather around me, place your hands on Paisley Ann as we pray over her. God of grace, we give you thanks for bringing Paisley Ann into the family of God, for uniting her with her sisters and brothers in this congregation. We ask that you bless her as she grows, as she matures, and as she learns to proclaim your name. Amen. Amen. Paisley Ann? I've been sealed with the cross of Christ and the Holy Spirit forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> this candle, um, we are lighting off this larger candle, which is called the Christ candle, or the Paschal candle. Um, you can go ahead and light that. And this reminds us that in a world that can sometimes be dark, that Jesus Christ is light. Um, and Paisley Ann is now part of that light. And when she gets to the point where she's old enough to understand what happened here today, um, you're to take this candle, you're to light it, and you are to help her understand that she bears Christ's light into the world um, so that people will hear the things she does um, or hear the things she says, she what she does, and glorify her Father who is in heaven. Let us welcome our new sister in Christ. And with the words printed on the screen, we welcome you into the body of Christ as we nurture our relationship with God. We reach out to all people everywhere and as we honor and care for God's good creation. We promise to equip you and pray for you in your new life in Christ as you join us in serving and growing disciples. Thanks be to God. Amen. This can have a seat and you all just stand up because Pastor Tim has some things to tell you. You can blow that out. Yep. All right, y'all. Who here has ever been to or thrown a party before? All right, think with me for a second. What do we need to have a good party? Yeah. Cake. Uh, cake. cake, yeah, that's a huge number one, right? Something to eat, cake, awesome. What else do we need to have a good party? Let's plan it, yeah. Other people, all right, we need other people, right? Okay, all right, uh, what else do we need, Maggie? Streamers. streamers, all right, anything else? Yeah, you gotta have streamers at the party, right? A place to be? Man, you're thinking real basic. I like this. What else do we need? Yeah, Natalie. Balloons. Balloons. All right, so we're decorated. We got some food. Birthday presents. We're assuming it's a birthday party. Birthday presents. Absolutely. Okay, right. So you need presents, streamers, balloons, a place to be. I really like also that you said people, right? Because let's say you had all those things and you were just alone in your house you get to eat the whole cake. You can buy yourself a birthday present, right? But otherwise, you're just kind of standing around going, woo, party time. Or if you're me, you can say party, Tim. Huh? Get it? All right. So, but we need other people, right? In the story we are reading today, Jesus attends a party. It's a wedding party. And Jesus is there to help the people be in relationship with each other. What happens is they run out of drinks in the middle of the party, and the party's going to have to end. But Jesus stands up and provides wine for the people so that the party can continue. Downstairs, you are going to be learning about John the Baptist. John the Baptist invites everybody into the party that God is throwing through Jesus. And the way that we get invited, one of the ways, is through the water of baptism. So what I would like you to do is take... The water of baptism here. 
Make the sign of the cross on your body or over your head. And know that you are loved and blessed and you can head on down to Sunday school. If you can't reach, have a friend help you. You want to come? You want some water? Your parents now. The splendor of the king Clothed in majesty Let all the earth rejoice All the earth rejoice Dance himself in light And darkness tries to hide And trembles at his voice and trembles at his voice. How great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. And always sing how great. How great is our God. The age to reading from the Gospel of John. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, What concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. 
His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. And when the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs, in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory. And his disciples believed in him. This is the gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. Let's open in prayer. God of abundance, we thank you for Jesus' first sign in Cana of Galilee at the wedding. We thank you that through the provision of abundance, through the joy of wine, God in Christ, you have made possible the flourishing of human relationships. We ask again this day, God, that you would bring your abundance into our lives, into our hearts, that we would be able to rejoice and revel and share in the goodness that you provide through Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. When my uh, dad was younger, he shares this story uh, sometimes with the communities that he serves. When he was younger, uh, in middle school, he would always go home from school with his best friend who lived next door. And they would always, after school, go into his best friend's house to play. Uh, He loved this for a while when they were younger. But as he got a little bit older into middle school... Whenever he went to his friend's house after school, his friend's dad would be waiting for them. And his friend's dad would always have a question for them. He would ask them, what questions did you ask today? And as a 6th, 7th, 8th grade kid uh, who struggles to articulate any thought, my dad found this particularly difficult to answer. And so he got really good at lying and making up questions that he had asked throughout the day. You see, because my dad and his friend weren't permitted to play until they had both told his friend's dad what question they had asked that day. Now, if anybody has worked with or spent time around middle schoolers before, and you ask them simply how their day went, you know that getting any answer at all can be difficult. Think to sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. You ask them, how was your day? And they say, good, fine, or bad, and if they say bad, you say, you want to talk about it? They go, no, and then they go into their rooms, right? Or, uh, right? Okay, this is the answer, I'm sorry, Noah, that we often get from middle schoolers, right? This was the same way my dad reacted to this, and so at the time, he absolutely dreaded it. He hated it. He hated going over and having to answer this question about what questions he had asked during the day, but as an adult, he's come to really appreciate what his friend's dad was trying to do for them. You see, his friend's dad was trying to encourage them to approach life with critical thought, to approach their lives with wonder and curiosity, and have the courage to actually ask the questions that come to mind. The unfortunate truth of our lives is that we're so often told that we are not to ask any questions. In adulthood, we're told that you have to give this uh, sense, this perception, that you have all the answers, that you have it all together. And so questioning gets tamped out of us over time. And yet this question remains. What questions did you ask today? It's a good reflection for all of us. And it is a question that I think the Gospel of John necessarily asks us. What good questions can we ask as we approach our faith with openness and curiosity, when we don't assume that we have all the right answers, when we need to look for who God might be in our lives? What questions do we ask? The Gospel of John invites questions 
The Gospel of John tells us it is good to wonder, to have curiosity. Nowhere is this more evident in this gospel, this collection of stories about Jesus' life, than in the stories of Jesus' miracles. You see, because in the gospel of John, there really are no miracles. Now, that might be surprising. We just saw, read, heard a miracle story here. And if you've been in church for any amount of time, you may have seen children's sermons where the pastor performs a miracle for the children where they put a ring of Kool-Aid at the bottom of a jug, right, and turn water into wine. A miracle is something we can create, something simply outside of the laws of physics. But in John's gospel, there are no miracles. I'd like you to take your bulletin, look at on the the front of your bulletin on the very last line where it says, Jesus did this. Do you see that? I want you to respond here. Jesus did this, the first of his signs. In the Gospel of John, there are no miracles. There are only signs. And what do signs do? At the most basic level, a sign is a pointer. A sign doesn't insist on something in itself, but points to something beyond it, right? You enter into a town. You enter here into Circle Pines. You see a sign that says, Welcome to Circle Pines. They're not welcoming you, this is really obvious, they're not welcoming you to the sign. They're welcoming you to the community that the sign represents. Jesus doesn't perform miracles in John, he performs signs. Acts that point to who Jesus is, who God is, and why that matters for us. See, these stories, these miraculous stories about Jesus may tempt us to wonder about how he performed them or what really happened, but how and what are not the point of the gospel. Who and why are the questions that we are invited to ask. So let's take a look at what happens in the story, who Jesus is and what that might mean for us. Jesus along with his disciples and his mother, Mary, are invited to a wedding in Cana of Galilee. If you're wondering if there's anything special about Cana, the answer is no. Nothing special at all. This is a podunk little town in the backwoods of Galilee. He's invited to this wedding. Weddings at the time were these huge community affairs where everybody in the town would get together for days on end. They were these giant drinking parties, right? AA did not exist back in Jesus' time. These were giant drinking parties. People would get together and party all day long. They served not only to bring a community together and bless a couple as they got married, but they served to sort of reinforce the social order as well. The wealthy people, the powerful people, got good wine, right? They got the good stuff at the beginning. They got first say in what they ate. The poorer Less powerful people got the bad stuff. They got the Carlo Rossi at the end of the day, right? Jug wine, not that good. They reinforced this social order. And so they're at this days-long party, and suddenly they run out of wine, revealing not only that the bride and groom didn't plan well enough for this party, but that maybe the bride and groom are part of this impoverished class. Maybe the bride and groom couldn't afford to do their social duty, and so they're starting their lives off on the wrong foot together. So Mary comes up to Jesus, and like a great mother, she knows what he's capable of, and she says, they don't have any wine. Notice she doesn't ask him a question. She just hints at it. We've experienced this in our lives before, right? (laughs) They don't have any wine, Jesus. What does he respond? Woman, (laughs) what is that to you and to me? He's lucky he's an adult, because if he was a kid, he probably would have got slapped across the face for that comment. Woman, what is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. And yet it seems that Mary knew something that Jesus didn't, that in fact his hour of glory had come, that it was time to start revealing who he is as God among us, the Word made flesh. And so Mary, rightfully, like any good mother would, ignores her son walks over to the servants and says, do whatever he tells you. Jesus, seeing the six giant jugs of water for purification, says to the servants, all right, mom's right. 
Go fill these up to the brim with water. The servants go and they fill up these jugs for the rite of purification up to the very brim. We're talking like 180 gallons of water here. And Jesus, through whatever mechanism Jesus does these things, turns the water into wine. They scoop out a glass of it and give it to the chief steward. The chief steward then says, normally people serve the bad wine after everyone's already drunk at the wedding, but you've kept the good stuff until the end. This means that Jesus has kept the good stuff not only for the wealthy who get access to it first, but has kept the good stuff for all. This is an act of radical inclusion, saying all are worthy of the good stuff. God provides the good stuff abundantly. And this is revealed only to the servants and to his disciples. But everyone gets to share in the good stuff at the end of the day. So what do we learn? We can ask those good questions. Who? Why? Who is Jesus in this story? Well, what we see is that Jesus is the embodiment of God's abundance and provision. Jesus is the thing that purifies and nourishes. Jesus is the provider of wine that makes possible the relationships that are being formed at this wedding. Jesus provides the means of flourishing, good, right relationships between people. Jesus provides it for all, not just for the elite. We learn a lot about who Jesus is from this very simple story. And ultimately, we learn about God. We learn that we, people, have a God of abundance. You see, because this story isn't special just because it was a miracle that happened 2,000 years ago. This story is special because our God of abundance takes on flesh here still today. Our God of abundance is among us yet to this very day. Just when it looks like scarcity might win. Just when it looks like we might devolve into excess, our God provides enough, enough to share, enough to make human relationships flourish, enough for you. We have a God of abundance. I think this is important for us in particular, because we live in a culture, in a society where we don't recognize abundance very often. You see, abundance causes gratitude. It leads us to share. It leads us to recognize the humanity of our neighbors and insist that they receive the same abundance as we have. But so often, we are sold a lie, a lie that says, there isn't enough. You don't have enough. You aren't good enough. We believe lies of scarcity. These drive our political conversations. These drive our economic concerns. These drive the way that we make private decisions about what we have. We're told this message all the time. It's the tool of marketing. There isn't enough. You have to get yours. And because we're given this message, in the wealthiest country that has maybe ever existed, Because we are given this message, we see our neighbors not as neighbors, but as competitors, as people to fear, people to keep up with. And so our lives and communities are torn apart. We become private individual people, not citizens, not neighbors together, but just simply consumers. And in order to battle that demon of scarcity, we start to live in excess, taking more than we need. In the United States, we throw away almost as much food as we consume, a one-to-one relationship. And oftentimes, the food we throw away is perfectly fine for eating, but it just looks a little bit nasty. Anyone who has ever worked in a grocery store knows that a big part of your job in that produce section is to pull out anything that's even slightly bruised, food that's still good, but that we throw away. This waste contributes to environmental degradation, to the problems of poverty and hunger and homelessness in our world. So where is the God of abundance 
for us? Where do we see and experience this God of abundance? Well, the good news is that we are not abandoned and we are not alone. That this God of abundance is faithful and believes that we don't have to live in this cycle of scarcity and excess. This God of abundance says there is enough for us to share. There's enough to go around. The God of abundance is here. The God of abundance is the nephew of one of my colleagues who has a drawer full of the thrivent financial live generously shirts that you sometimes see cropping up in our church. He's 11 years old, and every day of his life he wears a shirt that says in big letters, live generously, that he got from an event at his church. And he takes it seriously. This little boy, this 11-year-old boy at Christmas was given a gourmet box of C's candy, delicious C's chocolates. And as soon as he got it, he opened it up and divided it so that all of his cousins could have an equal share in the goodness he had been given. His aunt, a colleague of mine, walked up to him and said, why are you giving away your Christmas candy, you psychopath? What's wrong with you? <gasps> and he looked down at his shirt and he said, Aunt Sarah, I wear these shirts for a reason. God's abundance is here among us. This last Friday, I had the amazing privilege of taking over a dozen sixth graders to the food shelf here in town that provides food monthly for 220 families. And they do so largely in part by rescuing food from grocery stores and other places that would otherwise be thrown away. Perfectly good food. They also accept donations from people. There we talked about the fact that hunger still exists in our world. That even in the United States, one in five kids doesn't know where their next meal is going to come from. And yet I can't tell you how much food I just toss away every week. Our God of abundance is here working in places like the Centennial Food Shelf, places like Manna Market where every Monday people gather around and have a meal and share and get enough to take home as well. There is enough. You are enough. God's abundance is for you. So this week I'd like you to ask yourself, where do you see God's abundance in your life? And how might you spread the joy. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Whenever we gather for worship, prayer is a part of that, and we pray for individuals and situations of all kinds. Let me say on the outset of that that uh, there is a care team, a dozen people, highly dedicated, committed people, who are available that in those short-term situations uh, where you might need some help in a variety of ways, uh, let it be known to us because we would like to be there for you. So we not only pray for you, but offer the hands and feet of Christ to you in that way. Let's pray. O oh Lord, you have gathered us together in a gorgeous and wonderful day, a day of worship, a time to be together and be reminded that we're not alone, but we stand shoulder to shoulder with brothers and sisters, all looking for the same thing, looking for a God who loves us more than we could even imagine. So thanks for speaking out to us. Thanks for coming to us. Thanks for reminding us that you are a God who never runs out. There is always more than enough. Lord, in your mercy, we give you thanks also for this congregation and the witness that it gives. May we continue to be reminded of our abundance and all the resources and the talents that we have and to put them to good use so that your kingdom might be furthered and those who have not yet found you or are searching for you might do so through this very, very place. Lord, in your mercy, Continue to be with those who grieve, for those that they love, for those who uh, have been taken from us in death or sickness in all different kinds of ways, for those from whom we are separated. Be especially with the Holtz and the Kohler family as they grieve for Donna. We ask you as well that you would be with Roy and Diane and John and Duane and the others that we now list in our own hearts to you at this time. Lord, in your mercy, all these things and whatever else you should see that we would need, we trust that you will provide for us just as you promised you would. May our trust in you be greater than our fear of what we don't have. And all this we would ask in Jesus' strong and wonderful name. Amen and amen. The peace of Christ be with you all. And you can do the same with each other and do it in a way that seems right to you. If you're not into with hands, do it with elbows or ears or eyes or waves or whatever else seems right to you. Please be seated. As we heard uh, today in the sermon, uh, we worship a God of abundance, and God has provided us with more than we can ever possibly use. So we come with an offering of thanks, and we do that now. We receive that thank offering. Ushers, you can come forward, please.
I invite you to stand, please. Thank you. Together we pray. God of grace, you ask us to follow your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. As Jesus gave everything to make us his, we follow him by placing ourselves and what is ours. Amen. come to a table again today, it is the Lord's table, where the bread and wine never run out. Thanks be to God for that. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner also he took the cup, he offered it to them and said, Drink from it. For this cup is the new covenant in my blood given and shed for you and all people for the forgiveness of your sin. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Together we pray. Our Father in heaven, 
hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Be seated, please. I remind all of us again that this is the Lord's table and that all are welcome and uh, the body and blood of Christ is to be shared. So come, all is ready and all are very welcome. the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs for you, my Lord. When can I come to you again to praise you as before? Why should I let this 
invite you to stand as we pray our prayer. O oh God, in Jesus you have given us the good wine of forgiveness and blessed us with the bread of life. Keep us in your love as you send us out to be your children in the world. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Our closing song. in peace, serve the Lord. There you go.
Jesus comes along. 